Hello, welcome to the first episode of Forest Focus, and it's a big one as Nottingham Forest put in their worst performance of the season, so he's 1-0 at home to Everton, putting the spotlight firmly on Steve Cooper with two massive away games to come. Joining to discuss what went wrong, why, and where we go from here are, first of all, Reds fan Greg Mitchell. Morning, Greg. How are you? Yeah, I'm all right. Bit of a cold after the uh, the weekend, but we're getting there, so feeling a bit better this morning, a little bit when more you were... optimistic. You were panicked a few seconds ago because my sound was terrible. Mikey had no sound, so you were worried it was going to be you and Lewis. But yeah, well, we're good to go. So sorry we're five minutes late, but we appreciate everyone there waiting around for us. I mentioned Lewis there, former Reds midfielder Lewis McGugan's with us. Lewis, you well? Yeah, yeah, really well, thanks. Uh, good, I'm good. Really good to have you with us as ever. And our third guest is Reds fan Mikey Clark. Mikey, Christmas jumper number four, I think. How are you doing? I'm all right. Thank you very much. I hope everybody else is. This is a Roy Keane Christmas jumper. You can see it. I'm on the phone today. So, yeah, I'm going through my repertoire, as you know. Well, I'm sure there's many more to go. I'm sure there's many more to go. Right. Uh, obviously, it's going to be a bit miserable, some of this, because it was bad on uh, Saturday. But a few thank yous before we start. Uh, thanks for everyone who messaged after... Uh, well, we didn't exist until Thursday night. So, thanks for everyone who's messaged since then. Follow us on Twitter. Subscribe. Left a review on iTunes or Spotify. Uh, if you want to keep helping us, like and subscribe this video. That would be massive. Uh, subscribe on any audio platform. Give us a good iTunes rating or Spotify. Uh, we had 44 five-star ratings without saying a word, so that's a massive help. And finally, um, also a big thank you to the Trent Navigation, who are our, I didn't say sponsors, but partners in this new venture would be a better word. Um, they've been a massive help to us for a couple of years, really, doing the live shows and stuff. So it's great to be working with them. Uh, a quick plug to uh, help them out as well they are showing uh fulham versus forest on wednesday uh at the nav and it is curry night and it's good curry and it's very uh reasonable at eight pound fifty so it's on wednesday the 6th of december get down if you can obviously the navigation's on meadow lane and thanks again for their support they're going to back us uh all the way so we're very grateful right down to business it was not good on Saturday, in many ways for you, Greg, I guess. Um, uh, kick us off. You can talk about Forza if you want and what went wrong, but also just your thoughts on the game against Everton. Yeah, I am. Um, I'm trying to get a bit healthier at the minute, so I'm off the booze. And uh, it was a long day. It was a long day. We had the pre-match with Louis Croft and uh, singing. He was brilliant. Then the display, and then we had to watch that. But. Uh, I don't know. Is that what you lot have been watching for the last couple of years? Maybe, <laughs> maybe I've got it all wrong. <laughs> no wonder I get so much stick in the comments. But uh, yeah, I was just so good. I was good before kickoff because you know the fans put so much effort into when we do do a display, and every single penny comes from the fans that support us. And you know it was a mistake, and I'm sure whatever happened. Uh, they're feeling terrible about the Mullock entire thing, but that was so important to to making the display what it what it should have been. And you know, it was just gutting. But, you know, in hindsight, that was the, the least of our worries on the, on Saturday night, wasn't it? It just wasn't very good. It wasn't very good at all. And we can only go uh, we can only get better from there, let's say. Um Mikey, uh I'll say you messaged me on Saturday night and said, "Don't have me on. I'm so angry. I don't know what I'll say." And then I was like, "No, you got to come on." But I was I was worried every single Christmas jump would be in a pyre and set alight the way you felt on Saturday. Before we come to Lewis, how are you feeling about it now? Yeah, I'm all right now. I'm one of these people that just has to get it out of my system. So uh, the initial first few hours after a really poor performance is, is where I'm most volatile, to be honest. But um, th this is why I'd never make a good manager, because when they interview him straight after the game, I'd be awful. I'd be sacked within a week. Um, yeah, how am I feeling now? More reflective. Um, watch the game back. Uh, I echo what Greg, Greg said, really. It was just disappointing from start to finish. Um, you know, the mess up with the, with the preparation of the, of the Mullock entire... I know how much hard work went into that. A few of my mates was helping out Greg, brilliant team, and they were absolutely freezing. But, you know, putting thousands of cards on seats, it didn't happen. I noticed at the start when they were announcing the names of the teams, they put Matt Turner's um, picture up. It just it was just wrong from the first minute. And then when we obviously started, started playing, I thought we started OK, if I'm honest. Um, but then the game was just a bit of a mess. So um, we deservedly got nothing from it. Um, I've questioned a lot around our, our style and what we've tried to do that game to try and win it. 
Um, I'm sure we'll dissect it in the next half hour, hour. Um, but I'm more reflective now, more um, analytical. I think there was a lot of angry people when I left the ground, a lot of people questioning where we go from here. It felt like, I said on Thursday on, on, on the last one that we did um, on the previous podcast, that sometimes in a season you get a really pivotal game and it just feels pivotal um, around Christmas. I think this was probably the first one of the season where it was almost like a, a yardstick or a checkpoint of where we're at. And especially with Everton being deducted points, we could have moved further away from them. As it is, we didn't. And it was a really poor performance and there's a lot to work, lot to work on. Um, but yeah, I'll stop there because I'm sure when we go, when we analyse it a little bit more, Matt, I have a few thoughts around what we can do better. And, and I think there's a lot of it. But yeah, just a really disappointing, frustrating day. Nothing came off. I think they were rubbish as well, to be honest, but they were very clinical. Um, it was just one of those games where we were brought down to a level that just doesn't suit us in a way of, a way of operating on the pitch. Two banks of four. We got outworked, outran, and it was just very low f- feeling from the game. But let's use this to try and pick ourselves up and figure out where it went wrong and then hopefully get us up and running for, for, for Wednesday at Fulham because that is now a, a really big game. I watched, uh, I was there, and then I watched the highlights back. And it was weird watching the highlights because we should have had a penalty, which we'll come on to. We had we hit the post and we made some good chances. But I still felt it was a, definitely our worst performance of the season. Do you agree with that, Lewis, having watched it as well? Or do you think there was something to take from it? What was your reflections on the game? No, listen, I think that we can all... Uh be pretty adamant that it that it that it wasn't a, a good performance and it, it it was more kind of we just didn't really get going just didn't really get going from the start and okay there was a little bits where you where you felt okay there might be a little turn and it just kind of petered out and and that was pro- probably the story of the of the game really but it, it, it's the point that I've made uh quite a few times on here it, it, it's that our performances, especially at home, when we play well, they all come from counter-attacking, sitting in. And if you look at, okay, this season, you look at the home games and the home performances, they've probably not been up to standard. But if you look at Aston Villa game, which which I was there as well, again, Villa are the more dominant team. Everyone expects Villa to come here and have most of the ball. And that plays into Nottingham Forest hands. And I think that we we still, I said it at the live show when we did, our, the the change of what we need to now do is understand that at home we need to go out and dominate teams instead of sitting in, sitting in. Because when you come up first, you're now one of probably the the, the lesser teams and, and most teams that you play, uh, you you expect to have less of the ball uh, and to try and nick something. But with your second season, again, you you add players in and you spend more money you now want to change the kind of dynamics of uh, the way you play, especially at home, and you want to be more front foot and dominate the game. And I, I, and I still feel that we really struggle uh, at home when teams come and sit in and we have to break them down. It feel like the atmosphere is gone, Greg, from last season. We were so vaunted for what we were. I, I feel like we're just another Premier League club at home now. And I don't blame the fans for that because we've not given the performances bar Villa to justify it. But one of our biggest weapons has gone from last season. Yeah, and it, that was we, we kind of knew that was coming, wasn't it? The the attitude is always going to change. It's so so hard to keep all that excitement up. And you see it from every other team in the Premier League. That's why they were so surprised how great ours was. There was times at the start of the second half on Saturday when the crowd really got up for it and they kept things going. Uh, and against you know the likes of the Villa, it it happened. There was a really good atmosphere, but uh, it's it's certainly not a reason, is it? The, the players have to give your team something to really get up for. And I just felt on Saturday there was there was too many errors, there was too many missed opportunities, there was too many almost moments where we looked good and then the ball was rubbish or you know we'd lose the ball. There was, um, <laughs> I don't know how Everton have won three on a row as well away from home because I thought they were awful. There was a time at the end of the first half where I think there was like five passes where we'd pass it to their player, they'd pass it to our player. It just kept happening. And, you, you know, to say how much, oh, I don't know. I'll I tell you one thing that, that does annoy me now. 
Sean Dyche is the one manager that knows more about Nottingham Forest than I think any other Premier League manager in this division. It, he's a brilliant advocate for our city. He's always at the gigs, but whenever Everton aren't playing, he's always at our ground. And I think we've given him an advantage there. I think we should uh, rescind his pass or whatever he's got for the next time we play him because I think he figured us out, didn't he? He let us have the possession. He let us, you know, keep a lot more of the ball that we're not used to. And that is a worry for me that the the lower the lower part of the table are figuring out how to how to get something against us, especially at home. This this now, you know, it still sounds good and what is it, defeated in four in twenty two or something at home. That still sounds a good stat, but it's not at all in our current situation, you know, how this home form is this season. So it's gotta change. It's gotta change quick and these players have got to prove that they they want to stick with Cooper as much as a lot of us want to stick with him. And I think that has to come in the next two games, if not the next game. What was your take on it tactically, Lewis? Because it felt to me, I said this to you on WhatsApp last night, we just played into Everton's hands. Like everything was meat and drink for their two centre halves who played well. And I thought Decore and James Garner played well. But everything we did was, it felt like we moved the ball really slowly. When we went wide, we got crosses in that were too easy to deal with. I just didn't understand. You know, I just thought we made it too easy for Everton. What did you make of it? Yeah, I think I think if you look back, it's it, it's a formation and a way we've played uh, this season. I think everyone knows what Everton are going to come and do, and 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 they they play the same home and away. They have that kind of a four 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 two, but it's more Decora sits in as a ten, but he's he, he's a very different ten, and he and he kind of he, he's that physically imposing uh and he and he gets around that much he covers so much distance so he helps that formation but i think that if you look at it from our point of view uh i think the midfield was wrong uh i didn't like the midfield matchup at all uh i don't i don't feel that you can play uh yates sangara and mangala as a free and my, my point is that because mangala is still playing as a deeper one uh i think you lose uh, Dominguez, I think you lose his quality. I think you lose his energy on the, in that little final third to try and make something happen. And I think that the midfield three was probably too too rigid, uh, and especially against a, a an Everton team that, especially the centre of the pitch, they're going to sit in blocks, two centre halves, uh, and two midfield players. You need players to maybe uh, have a little bit of that spark, a little bit of that different to break them lines and 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 create them spaces. I think if you just play in front of players and teams like that you're 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 playing into the hands and uh, as you as you said a lot of it then come from the wide areas where where uh Brayfrey and, and uh Tarky will will eat that up all day that's what they do that's what they've done the whole career so uh I think it was more of maybe running out of ideas in terms of going down the sides and putting putting in balls and then you vert you look at Chris Wood and you think that's where we're going to have to try and get him into the game so I I think maybe uh, if 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 Steve and his and his staff look at it uh, this morning, I think possibly they got the midfield free wrong. Uh, but that's that's just my opinion. You were a bit um, down on. I think you were down on Yates starting, Mike. You weren't you? And it, obviously, there's well, you, you can lead us into the Chris Wood discussion as well if you want, because because you know it didn't work. And it creates another debate, but there were so many problems going forwards, weren't there? There were, yeah. And I echo what Lewis has just said. Well, the, the midfield just looked wrong from the start. It, it just didn't have that 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 balance and that energy of Dominguez. I think somebody um, mentioned to me, I think at the game, that Dominguez might be slightly... But then I, I question why he's on the bench then. He's ill, he's ill. Um, and the fact that we didn't bring him on as well was baffling, if he's, if he's able to play. Um, yeah, the, the dynamics was just wrong. You know, I mentioned on, on the last one on Thursday around with two banks of four, there's a great opportunity there to get between the lines and get Gibbs White potentially in his favourite position. However you want to do that, it just never happened. You know, we, we got, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but it, it did feel like we got brought down to a level that just didn't didn't suit us. You know, Greg mentioned earlier on around giving the ball away, getting it back, giving it away. It was just like that most of the game. There was no pattern of play. There was no fluidity. And I will say this as well. I could have named that Everton team, Bar Calvert Lewin getting in off the top of my head. I couldn't name Forest team. Wouldn't have a clue. So I guess the question is, do we do we know what our best team is and why 
Why do we continuously change personnel and shape for the opposition? You know, surely now is a time where we need to try and get into a, into a rhythm and a routine of what we're all about. What is the style of play? How do we try and beat teams at home, as Lewis was saying? You know, if, we, if we're going to progress to the, to the level where we're going to have more possession and try and be on the front foot, then we need some consistency in shape and in, and in personnel. And I couldn't tell you the team for Fulham. I don't have a clue. And probably the, probably the same for Saturday as well. So I, I do question whether we know what we're trying to do as a team and how we're trying to win games. And, and the fact that we keep changing every week almost plays, I think, I mean, Lewis, you might disagree because you've obviously played the game, but I just think it plays into the opposition hands when we're constantly worrying about what they do. Um, and, and yeah, just on the Chris Wood thing as well, um, he didn't have a great game. None of them did, really, maybe. I think Mangala was OK. Murillo was obviously different class. He's a great player. But it was poor performance all around. Wood never got in the game. Again, he was just facing his own goal the majority of the game. And then to bring Origi on for 10 minutes, that's... I don't know. I, I just question everything about that performance and, and the sort of tactical idea behind it. Just very disappointing. And, and what we need to do is, and it's a cliche, we just we almost need to reset a little bit and figure out, you know, we've got three games coming up in a very short space of time, two away, but two teams that we can beat. And we need to figure out a way of beating them, not just worrying about them all the time. So I, I know there's probably one for a, a few discussion later in the week, Matt, but... I can take defeats. I'm a Forest fan. I'm kind of used to them um, over the years, but I can't take us not having a, a plan. And the plan just seems to change from week to week. And I understand when you play the bigger teams, you need to be flexible. I get that. But Everton at home? Like, really? So, I don't know. I, I questioned a lot. But no, Wood didn't have a good game, Matt. None of them did. And I just thought we just need to regroup because we've got a massive week ahead for everybody concerned. I think everybody knows that. What do you think about the chopping and changing, Lewis? I wanted Bolly to come back in for his aerial ability, so I can't complain about that. I'd be a bit of a hypocrite. But change the fullback again this game. The back four is different probably every match. Not, I can't think too many clubs do that. Normally, at least three out of the back four is pretty consistent. Is it? Is it a bit too much uh, flip-flopping around with the selection? Listen, I think, I think, it's, I think it's, it, it comes from a kind of wide... Uh, array of areas and and you look at it from from the manager's point of view and and he'll and his staff will start the week and and they'll probably have a plan for the upcoming game but as as we all know things happen every day and every day in, in football is a different day and and that plan what he had at the start at the start of the week uh could completely change come come saturday morning naming the team uh so then things can happen i also think that if if you look at the personnel and the squad no one's really cementing themselves. No one's really grabbing the shirt. So you, you're always, as a manager, sometimes you're trying to find something. And and you look at it, uh, perfect example, if you look at Yates, Yates has not really been involved uh, recently. But at that point in time, uh, as a player point of view, he's got to be asking the question, well, I'm, 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 I keep being out of the team, but really we're not, we're not really progressing. So at some point, my opportunity has got to come back again. And, and, and all these situations the manager's got to deal with, and that's sometimes harder when you when you get uh, higher in, in the league and, and and you start bringing in different calibre of players and different style of players. And, and I'm sure Origi hasn't come from the clubs that he come from to, to sit on the bench and not play. So all these all these situations will, will happen throughout the week and the manager and his staff have got to come uh, at the end of the week and, and, and decide take all that information on also you've got the information from the from the physios and the, and the club doctors about uh how how people can uh can kind of last the game and and how fit they are and 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 sometimes from a uh from a point of view from inside inside knowledge the manager's got to ask questions about certain players now sometimes it's just saying someone's uh unwell that can mean so many things and but he's just got to try and kind of deal with that and answer the question. You can't shirk the question, but there might be a lot more into that throughout the week, what's happened. So sometimes you play players that have, haven't have trained all week. I can remember when I sometimes played and I, I probably wouldn't have been in the, wouldn't have been in the training ground for three or four days. And, and you come in a day before you train one day and, and, and you take that gamble and sometimes it works. And sometimes you get out there and you feel absolutely horrendous. And, 
they're the little things maybe what's just going against the team and going against the manager at the minute them them little risks that he's taking where maybe last year at times uh they they went for us and like i said no one's asking the question no one knows any any different so uh in terms of the the swapping and changing i just think that he and his staff will always have a plan of what, how they want to do they'll have a plan uh regarding fulham uh, on wednesday but again there will be stuff that has happened sunday uh, today and even tomorrow that that might change that so uh look at listen it, it it's a tough it's a tough job trying to keep all these all these players happy and, and, and especially when you start bringing in the the calibers of of the Origi and, and and players like that they're they're going to come and and they're going to want to play uh, great to have over 300 people with us, considering, like I said, we weren't even a thing four days ago. So uh, if you haven't liked, do us a favour and just hit like. That'd be great. Does it feel, Greg, I mean, last year it still felt like a team, even with all the turnovers, uh, turnover of players. Does it feel like slightly less of a team this year, or am I getting a bit over the top? Because well, generally I think we played pretty well in games. This was our worst performance, but there just didn't seem to be much bite or fight in this game. What What did you make of the spirit around it it's probably over the top because i think as a team we're still in a better position than we were this time last year so i think the the spirit's still there we just we, i think we we're just obviously expecting so much more all our expectations have gone up i know the owner's expectations will certainly have gone up so he'll be feeling a lot worse than he did this time last year with the you know there's over 200 million pound investment now and we need to see more of an improvement. We all know that than we than we have been seeing. Uh, going back to players like Yates, he's been getting slated over the weekend, and yeah, he didn't have a very good game. But he also I it was did, all right. I don't think he, he was did, the worst one. He did win as a penalty. It wasn't given again. It should have been given. You know, it's the same as the ones last week. So I don't see how with VAR and I mean twenty of them looking at it that it can't be given. But the week previously, the same thing can be. So. It was just, I hate this swings and roundabouts thing, but it was, wasn't it? You're talking about a different game if we get a late equaliser, which I think we pushed very well for and it looked like it could have happened. But no, I don't think the team spirit is any worse than it was this time last year. I think it's different. It's different players. But you see how like the likes of Alanga, you know, they, they, they want this team to win. Every player on that pitch, I hope, wants this team to win. But I just need to see and want it so much more for, for Cooper because on Saturday I felt like there was just an element of, the, it just seemed a little bit too relaxed. It just seemed a bit like, you know, we'll do a bit of this and then try and cross it in or oh, it hasn't worked. We'll try that again. And these these wayward passes and then oh, we'll go for a long ball. It just seemed a little bit too messy for, for what we've been used to, especially at home. And that's that's the Sean Dyche thing. <laughs> that's Sean Dyche knowing exactly how to play against us. Because, like I say, every time Everton aren't playing, he's at our games, and I, I don't really like that as much as I like the bloke. But um, no, to to answer clearly, I don't think the team spirit's worse than it was last year. The other thing, going back to the whole striker thing, Mikey, I suppose the question is: should the drop off between Taiwo being in the team and not being in the team be? this big because we did score goals without him we you know we scored two against Brighton but this was the first game where we looked I mean there was just very little up front I don't want to bag Chris Wood too much because he scored three goals this season his performances generally apart from the last two haven't haven't been terrible but the cohesion and uh, you know attacking fluidity at the moment is just it, it's not there with the, the way Wood played on Saturday is it and that's more of a collective thing but it's just not working quite right yeah, it's a collective thing. And I, I think as well, um, if anybody was questioning what Tywo brings to the side, if you watch Saturday, you'll know like the drop-off is, is absolutely huge. Chris Wood is obviously a different different makeup, different type of striker. You know, Plyde is trading this league for, for a long time. So it, it, he's a good option. But we're going to have to go with him and Origi now going forwards with Tywo being out probably till, I don't know, March, April. Um, what's interesting for me is that, that we... Um, I think we've acquired 42 players We got promoted and we are so reliant on one. And how does that make everybody feel? So, you know, you, you take Taro out of that team and it would just look a completely different team. So if anybody was under any doubt, and I hope hopefully this is not the case at the club, but, you know, what we need in January 
we need something up front because even when Tyro comes back, he's going to be out for a long time. He might not be up to speed straight away. Um, the, the drop off is is absolutely huge. Um, just going back to, to one thing as well, Mike, just to add to what Greg was saying, if that's okay. Um, we were talking on on, on Thursday around. Um, I think you asked the question, uh, "Are we a mid-table side?" And I said no. And the reason I said no was because we've not proved it yet. So on paper and in terms of the investment and the structure and what we're trying to do, we're trying to be one. And I don't think we're far off. But are we one now? No, absolutely not. And, and that's the challenge for the players. You know, if they want to be, if they want to keep the manager around and if they want to push it to the next level, got to find ways of those performance levels because that, that on Saturday was hopeless. I want a little better phrase. Now, if people think I'm critical now, imagine what it was like on Saturday night. <laughs> Try to be a little bit more refined now. Um, so yeah, I mean it's it's just a big it's a big week coming up for the club. There's, there's no doubt about that. But I do. Th- I've got a question for you actually, Matt. Seeing as it's it's the first podcast with Forest Folk. Quick one. For you. you know the booze at the end. Mm. That was frustration, wasn't it, from everyone? Do you think they were aimed at the team or the manager or both? Uh, more team than manager for me, but probably some of the manager. I mean, I'm walking out the ground. So I, where I was in the train, ended up at here. There were, excuse me, a fair bit of booze, but then everyone just got up and left, and I was one of them. No one really hung around to clap the players off, which they normally do. It was just a bit of an air of resignation and walking down the stairs, coming out of the ground. No one was saying Cooper's got to go immediately, but there was a bit of a feeling that uh, maybe it's slipping away a bit. And we can actually, we'll talk, it kind of leads into the manager's stuff. So we could probably talk about that now. This feeling that, you know, the fans kept Cooper in a job last season, but I think there's a more acceptance that you have to get results. And if you're not getting results, then, you know, any club's going to change manager, aren't they? Just kick us off on it, Lewis. What's your take on Steve Cooper? And we'll come back to a few other points, but it leads nicely into it. Yeah, listen, I think I think that uh, first and foremost, I think we, we sit here and we, respect and, and we understand what a fantastic job that he's done for this football club uh, uh, since he's come in. Uh, I think that he's took the, the football club, the city, uh, everyone connected to, to Nottingham Forest and he's he's made it such a better environment for everyone to be in. Uh, and, and I think that even when you look at this season and, and people saying, should he go or should he not? I think that it's never going to be easy and you're always going to go through through them situations. I think what the the kind of big negative for him will maybe be, if you look from an owner's point of view, uh, I was discussing it with a friend yesterday, is that when you look at where we are in the league, when you look at the teams around us, the money that we've spent compared to everyone else around us, as an owner's point of view, because that's the end of the day, we can all have our opinion, but at the end of the day, the the, the 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 final call will come with the owner of the football club and he will look at it from that standpoint of I'm spending X amount of money and I look around the teams and you look at, for instance, you look at Burnley, spent a little bit of money, but nothing. Sheffield United hardly spent anything. Luton, nothing. You look at Bournemouth, not they spent money, but again, maybe 60, 70 million over the, over the same period. Uh, and that's and that's at a push. Then you look at like so above Wolves, they've their manager left pretty much because they wasn't going to spend any money, uh, and that's why maybe Gary O'Neill's come in uh, to work with the existing squad. You look at Crystal Palace, never really spend money. So when you when you look at it like that, that's where I think the problems start to come, and that's where the questions start to be asked. And on that side, I think that's where. He may be in trouble, and it's only because, as as an owner's point of view, you look at it from that, and you're you're spending, you're giving that amount of money. I think he will expect to be at least mid table, top off, pushing to then that next step to be Europe, and 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 I think that's the that that will be the big question, and that will be a lot of the things going off in the background. I think that when you look around and the teams around us for the money that we spent, he would expect to be in a in a in a lot better position. I think for me, uh, I still back the manager at the moment um, because he's got a track record that I think he can turn it round. But he obviously has to do it. And the next two games are massive. And if we lose both, then you've lost five in a row and you've got one win in 12. And the two teams above us are directly above us. There would be a gap. So 
it's diff more difficult to make a case. You're trying to bring yourself at the feet of the owner there saying, I'm still the man. But I still think that if we had Tyro Awanyi, we wouldn't be in this position and we'd be fine. And if we keep Steve Cooper, I don't think we need to worry about relegation. But it is getting a bit more nerve wracking when you see Bournemouth picking up. So I think we're at the position now where we, I mean, you know, we need results. We can't we can't have performances like that Everton performance. But before then, I could take stuff out of every performance and could see we were going in the right direction. Everton was alarming and we do need to see much better at Fulham and Wolves. And it feels like a massive week for Steve Cooper and Nottingham Forest. If we lose both, then, you know, we're looking at a relegation battle, really. Where are you at it on, at on it, Greg? On it. I've said that all wrong. Where are you, Greg, on Steve Cooper? Uh, yeah, you've just got to give him every opportunity possible. But it's, uh, I know Lewis will, well, I imagine he'd disagree with me on this bit. But I just think the players have to prove that they want him to stay in the job as well. And it's it's down to them in the next two games. Because I think 90% of us really would understand that if he loses the next two games, it's not going to look good for him at all as well. And that would be a travesty after everything that he's done. Um, but yeah, you just you worry so much, and on on two real tough away games, two teams in similar positions to us. You know, Fulham have picked up again after the weekend, and you just think it's a horrible run now. These two games to to basically save his it save his job because, like you say, you don't lose five in a row on the, in the Premier League and not come under massive pressure, especially when you look at our owner's history with with Olympiacos. I mean. Uh, I'm sure he thinks as highly of Cooper as we do for everything he's done, but we've got to get results and we've got to get results quick. And I want nothing more than that to happen. I, yeah, people saying Cooper out and, and this, that, the other, you know, you've got, you've got to say, get a win on Wednesday, not that, because then what are you looking for? What are you hoping happens for that to happen? Because it obviously hasn't happened after the weekend and get a result, get a big result on Wednesday and then, Wolves is an even bigger game. Mm, I'm not even sure you have. I mean, Taz in the comments says we've uh, won out two out of 25. When are we going to win two away in a week? Um, I don't even think we have to win both games or even one of them. It's just two draws or something, we were, you know, we're just to settle the nerves a little bit. I think we're still, uh, you know, we're, at, we're ahead, ahead above water, but Bournemouth are starting to worry me because they look like they're clicking. And I, I don't read anything into Burnley beating Sheffield United 5 0 the way they are at the moment. Just before I come to Mikey, just pick up on that, uh, Lewis, what Greg said about players having to keep managers in a job. It's an interesting thing from a, an ex-player's point of view. Where, what do you think about that? No, listen, I, I think first and foremost uh, is that they have to they have to go out and play for themselves uh, every time that they step out on the pitch. The, 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 the when, when players sign for a football club, they, they sign for a football club and they sign for that manager. But the reality is, by the end of that that contract, especially nowadays, that manager won't be there. So you've got to kind of take it into context. And and first of all, they've got to go out and put uh, a performance on for themselves. Firstly, to stay in the team, uh, and to uh, and to really stake their claim. Obviously, there is when you look at it, players will have certain feelings towards certain managers and have, and have better relationships than others. That's just a part of any any work industry, really. That. That that happens, but I think that in terms of them them saving the manager's job, I think they've got to save their own job first, and they've got to put a performance in for themselves. And if they do that, then that should take care of the manager uh, manager's job because hopefully they'll win the game. But uh, but like, I, I think on the next two, I think that's the big thing about football. That's why we love it. That's why everyone's involved because the pressure of it and the change of it and. Listen, if we go and get two good results in the next week, it will totally change. And I think that's where, as football fans and people involved in football, as uh, unless you're at the real top end of, of the Premier League, that's where we are all season. I think that we go through ups and downs. At one minute, we feel like everything's fine. And then a month later, it could feel like, right, we're on that kind of hook where everything could kind of go different. So I think, listen, there's pressure. The players will know that, the manager will know that. But ultimately, that's why we're all involved in it, because uh, we thrive on that pressure. And I think that if we sit here and we get two good results uh, against Wolves and Fulham, then we're having a totally different conversation. And I think then again, it's it's now it's now looking forward. So, 
listen, I know, I know Saturday wasn't wasn't positive. The players will know that. The manager himself will know that. But the big thing about football is you've always got a chance to chance to change, and and that comes around uh, very quick. And like I say, you get a good result on Wednesday evening. Uh, the, the the whole outlook and, and mood uh, will completely change, and then that will help going into going into Wolves on Saturday. So I think, listen, I think we can we all have to agree that Saturday wasn't acceptable, uh, but we can also know that in a week's time we could have a totally different conversation and a do- and a totally different outlook on it. Yeah, I think Lewis is dead right, Mikey. If we get anything from the next two, we get a couple of draws from the next two and then pick up and go again. But like the big point Lewis said rightly there is Everton wasn't acceptable. We can't see that again. We just need to see a lot better immediately, don't we? We do, yeah. I was nodding along to that. Absolutely. Spot. That's why we do love football, because it could easily change in the next few days. And let's hope to God it does. Um just a couple of a, a points. I can't really add anything to, to what Lewis said. I think it's bang on. But just a couple of points to add. Um, you know what I was saying around um, Everton's team and naming Everton's team? I can name you Fulham's team, what they're going to play. So I guess my only advice would be, if anybody listens to this at Forest, just play your best team. Stop worrying about the opposition. Go and play your best team because we're not playing Man City. We don't know our best team though, do we? Well, that's it. So what, whatever... Cooper and the, and the guys think our best team is we should stick them out for the next two games so whether that's 4-3-3, three, three, Gibbs White on the right whatever, just play your best team stop worrying so much about what the opposition can do and there's one thing that kind of does annoy me a little bit is um, on the on the match and even pre-match press conferences we talk about how um, I think Steve Cooper said this a few times or oh, we mentioned it this week we mentioned it this week, it makes me wonder whether things are landing, so I think I've wrote down here six of the last seven or six of the last eight goals have been from crosses or second balls into the box. You know, teams aren't ripping us apart with one, two passes or sticking it in a top corner from 30 yards, mainly. It's just crosses into the box. So when you hear, oh, yeah, we spoke about this. Well, is it is it sinking in? So this go back to Greg's point. The performance levels have to improve. If they do, we've got a real chance of getting something on Wednesday and again on Saturday. And then if we do, the Tottenham game is going to be explosive because we'll, we'll be on a roll then. So it can change at the, at the drop of a hat. But I just think now's the time when the chips are down. What is it? One win in 10, one win in 11, something like one win in 10. You know, it's, it's, it's not great. So I think it's just the case. You've just got to be a little bit braver and say, what is our best team? What is it? How are we going to win this football game? And go, and go there and play the team. I'm not saying don't prepare for what, what they give you in, in, in their threats, because they do have some specific threats, which we'll have to plan for and counter. But... I just think the balance is wrong. We worry so much about what the opposition can do. Let's just think what we can do better. And we can play better and we can be better. But that starts with getting the right personnel on the pitch. So if Dominguez is fit, get him in. You know, for, for, for example, and I just hope we see positive team selections in the next two games. Because if, if we do, I think we'll get something. And we'll have a different conversation. You know, I, I was, I was um, praying for your first podcast on this, Matt, to be on the back of a win. But it's not. But it's right that we talk about it and face into it. And hopefully next Mondays we'll be having a completely different conversation around, you know, a couple of great victories and we'll be on a roll because it can change that quickly. I just want us to No, I'm a big Cooper. I am a Cooper advocate, believe it or not. Everybody listening and watching this. But I just think everybody, everybody needs to raise their game in the next week and fight for him and fight for him to, to, to stay at this club. Um, because if we don't, then we know what's going to happen. Yeah, I think so. I think these two games are massive. Are you going to Fulham, Greg? It's uh, it's the first game I'm missing in the Premier League era. I'm on uh, nights and I just cannot get it off. So, uh, yeah, weird one, really. It's going to be very weird not being there. But can I just go back to James Shepard said something in the comments that's really made me think as well a few minutes ago about, you know, even if it doesn't go right the next two games and they, they do make that decision... The runner games that a new manager has to start with is horrendous. You know, it's like three or four of Newcastle, Man United, I can't remember the others. So, yeah, someone it would be coming into a uh, a bit of a fire pit there. And um, we'll come. I was going to move on to Morgan Gibbs White, but I'll just pick up on that, Lewis. I said to you last night, my worry, and this is a very conservative mindset, is you sack Steve Cooper, you make the wrong choice, and it cascades into a Leicester City style relegation when there's no way it should happen. I mean, you know, you play for new managers coming in. 
it's some, is it sometimes better the devil you know than, than rolling the dice it, it would be such a big decision to to make a change wouldn't it yeah listen it it it, it, it it's always a massive decision uh getting rid of any manager uh but i think even more so with the with the kind of relationship and and the, and the uh relationship that everyone's built up with with the manager and he with the city with the fans so i think it's always going to have uh, a bigger blow if if the time comes and and steve cooper leaves the football club uh but listen i i i think also in that what we have to understand that football is is what it is and there'll be some players in that change room that probably don't have the same admiration or feelings to steve cooper and and so it, it swings roundabouts really that you might have some players in there that that will feel uh if the manager goes that uh their kind of kind of thought on that will be negative but there's also players in the change rooms that will have that kind of new lease of life with a new manager coming in and feel like their relationship with the with, with the previous manager uh kind of finished so it's always a risk it's always a risk and you get that you can get that new manager step and you see it some some teams can then go on a run uh, and they go into them the games what was what was just what was just said there and uh where potentially everyone looks at them and think it's a really tough period but a new manager could come in and and start getting a really good results in that period and, and then look at the look at the change of uh, opinion then so but i think i think at this point in time i think what we have to do is strip away the fact that talking about a new manager because uh at the end of the day Steve Cooper is still in charge of the football club uh, and for what he's done he deserves to be in charge of the football club and we need to kind of all be in the same camp at least this week uh and try and try and try and be uh, as positive as we can listen if we have to have, to have a conversation in a week two weeks time two months time that's a conversation we then have but I think it's but I think at this point in time uh, we don't need to have that negative mindset in in what a new manager or what what kind of new situation that may bring. Yeah, I think that sums up the discussion perfectly. We're, yeah, we're fully behind Steve Cooper. He's been in this position before, I mean, a couple of times last season and come out of it. And I think there's no reason not to have uh, at least some faith that he can do it again. So this week's big and let's hope we see better. Um, I want to get your take on Morgan Gibbs-White, Lewis. Because you sort of played that position and a central midfield attacking player who's been shuffled out wide and tried to make the best of it. He was really good against Brighton. I thought he had his best game of the season. And then you fast forward to Everton. I thought he had his worst game of the season. Nothing happened. Nothing came off. He looked up and gave the ball away too often. But then in mitigation, I was talking to someone in the pub after and they were saying, you know, he's he trying everything. His work rate was there. He had nothing to hit. Alanga was too wide. Woods just, you know, we had a terrible game. I'm going on, but sum up where you're at on um, Morgan Gibbs White, Lewis, because you you've had this experience as a player. What's where are you at on him? Yeah, it's uh, I'm, like I said, I know we spoke about it, spoke about it over the weekend. It's it's one of them. I I, I feel a bit of a connection. I feel it's kind of the similar roles and 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 what he's there to tell the team. I felt like. In my time at Forest, that's kind of the similar role that I had. It's, it, it's a really tough one. I think if we can, I think we all sit here. I don't think we understand the relationship that him and the manager have, but we do know that he didn't spend the money and bring him to the football club to play him uh, on the right side. That's that's just obvious. I think if you look at uh, Morgan's career, if you look at what he is technically on the ball, he, he, he's the best player in the squad. I think stuff that he can do with a football and the things that he can see is at times a joy to watch. But I think that you you have to understand that if you take when he was at Sheffield United, Sheffield United had deals in the championship. Most times they played every week, they had most of the ball. He had very a, a bit of a free role. And I think when you then take that into a into a team where you're maybe at the bottom end of the league games are a lot more tactical a lot more disciplined i think it's very hard for the manager to put him in that number 10 because i think we all understand and, and know that's his best position if you look at for premier league example if you look at the, the team's kind of bottom half if they they most of them play four three three or four but perfect example everton then their their advanced midfielder is not really that player you look at decora he's a runner very 
uh, on the ball, does a job, but nowhere near the same ability as a, as a, as a Gibbs White. And I think it's very hot. And I think that's what the manager realised early on is that he couldn't possibly play uh, Morgan in a 10 because I think we've, we've got overrun uh, in a better league with, with just two midfielders. So that's why you have to go for three midfielders. Now, now the look of it, he wants to keep on playing him. We understand that. We understand the relationship that they have. And that's when he goes out to the right-hand side. And it happened to me in my career uh, under Billy Davis. I went out to the left-hand side. Uh, and we had Paul Anderson off the right hand side and, and Chrissy Cohen and, and Paul McKenna in the middle. But my role wasn't really a winger, it was a bit of a kind of a free role, but uh, uh, half and half off that left hand side. And it, and it sometimes does work, as you said. Some games you look and you think, yeah, he played really well. And then some games he doesn't really kind of get involved or it doesn't really happen for him. But the bottom line is he's not a right midfield player. So I think sometimes it's a double edged sword that you want your best players playing, but sometimes you can probably do them more damage uh, yourself and the player because it's just not quite happening uh, and maybe maybe you might look at it and think you know what shall I kind of take him out for a few games maybe go a bit more solid and then just kind of bleed uh, kind of bleed him back in but little stage and let him go into the position that we all want him to be and that we brought him for uh, I think there's a bit of a crossroads I think what you can't do he, he won't want to be playing on the right hand side of midfield, but listen, he's doing a job for the football team and at the end of the day, he's playing football. So he's never going to turn down that opportunity. But I think that if you looked when he went into the to the centre of the pitch uh, for the last part of the game, listen, I think the game had gone and I think he, he got a bit worked up and maybe, like you said, he was trying things that just trying to get a spark and make some fam- something happen. And sometimes you can try, you can try a bit too much. But, uh, but I think... We need to strip everything away and understand that he is attacking. He's probably uh, our best, our best player in our squad and our best player in the team. And when we look for stuff to happen and someone to have a spark and to make something out of nothing, he's that player. So you sometimes that pressure does come when you're struggling to get results. He will take that pressure on board because he knows why he's in that team. And and sometimes being that player, you can maybe force things and try things a bit too much, and and it ends up ends up having a negative effect. But listen, I'm sure he will come good. But maybe the manager might have to look and think, you know what, let's look after him a little bit. Maybe let's take him out of the firing line. And yes, OK, we might not have that spark he has, but let's have him maybe coming off the bench for the two games and having that little attacking spark. I did that a few times. And it kind of takes that pressure on him that you've got a bit more uh, defensive players that play, play away for 60, 70 minutes and, and do a really good job, and then you wait, and you get the, the the ability that he has comes in. The game kind of opens up, the spaces then come, and he's fresh, and he comes on and does his magic. And at times, wins you the game. And I think maybe we need to look at it like that in, instead of probably just forcing, 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 forcing. Because I don't think it's doing the team any good, and more importantly, I don't think it's doing doing Morgan any good. Yeah, my gripe with his. My, my only real gripe his performance was trying to do too much at 1-0 down and shooting from areas where he's never going to score. But there wasn't much in front of him. So I sort of understand it. I don't mind players giving it away so much and having an off day. But, you know, just try and do a bit too much. So I, I see that there. Um, touching on a few more areas of the game before we go because the clock's ticking. I mean, this would be papering over the cracks of a poor performance. But at 0-0, Greg, I thought we should have had a nailed-on penalty. The, the foul on Yates was way more of a penalty than the Chris Wood one against Brighton and way, way more than the Callum hudson Adoy one. I'm still not sure that was a penalty. Uh, terrible inconsistencies of VAR. They said on Sky there wasn't enough in it to overturn the on-field decision, which to me is ridiculous. That was just a, an absolute stonewall penalty, wasn't it? The clear and obvious error issue to overturn a decision is just ridiculous. It's a penalty. All right, it's, it's not a clear and obvious error. The, the ref at the time in that split second thought, oh, maybe it's not a penalty. But his, his shirt's pulled about that far. Yeah, Yates always goes down like that. He's brilliant at it. Any other position on the pitch, it's a free kick straight away. Not one person, not on, one Everton fan says, oh, that's not a free kick. Of course it's a penalty. And again, it's just the look of the draw at the minute. And that's all it is, all with VAR. You know, you've got four or five of them in a studio who all think they're experts and they're clearly not. 
because they're getting so much wrong so often. Uh, it's a game changer. It's an absolute game changer. And again, that's why Ryan Yates plays because he creates opportunities like that. And, you know, it, it's just a sigma. It is. We, we maybe didn't deserve anything from that game, but God, we should have, we should have had that penalty and, that's it for me. There's not there's not really a discussion out there that it wasn't. Even the pundits were saying it was. Mm. Oh, it should have been a boring nil-nil. Oh, just quickly before I come to Mikey Lewis, was there anything we could have done better with the goal? It was a great finish by um, McNeil, but could Aurier get out to him quicker? I'm not sure he could. Uh, Hudson is always not doing a lot. What what went wrong? Yeah, listen. I, I think I think sometimes when the when the ball kind of transitions that quickness and it's gone from one cleared the first first phase, it's gone out. Uh, cross and it and it's it come to the to the back post and listen, Aurier, uh, first and foremost, he's got to attach himself to the to the centre half and and make sure that he's in and and that he's covering and and really the one on your outside is the is the least danger. Now, I think what we have to understand that is it's a great finish. It's a great finish and and sometimes that just happens and I think that listen, you always want to stop every goal and you can always tweak every and look at every incident and think where you could have done better but I think sometimes you just have to understand that maybe you got caught in the transition you tried to get out but I think you've got to give fair credit to McNeil and it's a it's a it's a first touch and it's a great finish and and sometimes it's that simple yeah I don't think I, I don't blame Ori for that I don't think he had a good game I don't think he moved the ball at all well and he doesn't look the player of last season but I don't blame him for that it's a great finish poor old well, I say poor old Vlacodon Moss, I don't think, has saved a shot for us in about three games. I'm not sure I'm blaming him for any of the goals. Yeah, I think Mikey might talk about Vlacodon Moss on another podcast, but the clock's ticking, so I want to just move on, Mikey, quickly. We mentioned Murillo. I mean, th there were a couple of positives, um, and he was the big one. Just He's head and shoulders above uh, you know, most players on the pitch most weeks now, isn't he? Can't believe he's only, what is he, 19? Can't believe he's 19 and barely played... Um, what did he play? Twenty odd games in Brazil, and then he's he's done a few for us. He looks like he's been playing for ten years. It, it reminds me a little bit, very different profile of um, you know when Dawson broke into the team and he played a cup game when he was seventeen, eighteen, and then Paul Hart stuck him in straight after because he was just really, really good. And then the first time I saw him, I was like, "Blimey, who's this guy? He's pinging passes forty yards. He looks strong, athletic. Um, again, different profile, but I think I'm with you, Matt. I think Murillo is." absolutely head and shoulders above anything we've got in that position and the fact he's only 19 and the fact that he's come to a, a new country doesn't speak the language and is fitted in like a glove i think it just speaks volumes for for him as a person and as um and as a football player he, he'll do whatever he wants in the game that lad i think he's that good you know if he's still with us in, <clears throat> in a, sorry in a couple of years time um that means we're doing really well <laughs> so let's hope he still is because I think he, he can probably take his pick, maybe even now, of, of where he wants to go. So, incredible bit of scouting. Well done to the Forest team, bringing him in, putting him on a long contract. And hopefully he's enjoying his time here. He looks like he's enjoying it. So, let's just try and, let's just enjoy him while we can and while he's, well, while he's at the city ground. His feeling is, is really high. And, you know, you can't blame him. And you, you can and just go back to the goal just really quickly, Matt. I know we pushed for time. Um yeah, it was just, it was one of those, it was just, basically it should have been nil-nil or 1-1 one -one if we would have got the penalty and we'd be talking about two poor teams. But as it happened, cracking finish by McNeil and we, we just didn't really turn up. So, big week ahead, like I said, and we've got to put it right. Um, but no, Murillo is a phenomenal footballer. But I love watching him. Brilliant footballer. So, again, to talk about performance levels. If anybody can get to anywhere near that performance levels, then we'll be OK. I just think everybody... Everybody just needs to raise the game this week. And if they do it, we'll be OK. Yeah, he's 21, I think, not 19, a couple of people are saying. Um, oh, you're old then. Get, get rid of him. <laughs> no, just a, a couple of quick points. McNeil's celebration was well over the top. Have you ever said, Lewis, I'll, uh, I'm meandering. Have you ever celebrated a goal by just giving it massively to the home fans when they haven't really said anything to you? Sometimes you're just so annoyed and you just want to give it back to, you know, give it pretty large. And McNeil really did that. What what was going on there? Yeah, to be fair, it was quite, when I, when I see that, I, because you, cause you look in a game and you kind of think, like, you see that kind of reaction. And, and I was my first thought was, I've not seen anything in terms of 
for him to have that reaction. But listen, we never know. Sometimes you're at pitch side, and I've been there, pitch side the the front row, and you get a bit, and you get a, get a bit of abuse. Organ, and it's it's just one of them. It, it's it, it's playful, it's harmless, and listen, there'll be a time where you know I mean you give it and you get it back, and I think sometimes we just we we, we what we have to do in the world we're in, and sometimes everyone jumps on these serious things. We've we've got to realise that 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 there's a bit of fun in it and and there's a bit of kind of uh look at it and don't take it negative and just think you know what maybe he got a little bit of stick he's given something back at the end of the day the end of the nine minutes everyone's kind of everyone's safe everyone's safe, everyone goes home and and um we uh we start another day yeah i wasn't fast it was just a bit weird um yeah, and Murillo made that brilliant, brilliant clearance off the line as well. And I, I, the only thing about Murillo is I'm a bit worried that he's our second most creative player. And we'll discuss tomorrow about the merits of three at the back and whether we just try and release Murillo as a ball-carrying centre-half even more. Now we've got Felipe back. And I was going to ask you about that, Greg. Having Felipe back was great. He probably could have been sent off. Uh, he took a good yellow card after being done and then flew in for a wild tackle. But overall... I mean, it's great to see him back. And I thought he, did, he he was one of our better players, wasn't he? I didn't think he'd play for us again. I just thought it was getting to that point where he was never seemed to be getting close. So I know a few around me were quite excited to see him. And uh, yeah, he almost scored as well. That's another thing he brings us. Just like Murillo, that that attacking sense Murillo's got. The, the bloke behind me says often, we've got 18 months of this, enjoy it while it's here. Uh, probably the same with Felipe, just because of his age, really. So... Uh, I'd love to see them two build up a real partnership. Injuries are key, aren't they? Especially with Felipe. Murillo took some knocks on Saturday. I don't know whether it was tactical, but a couple of times I thought, is he is he going to come off? He looked like he was really struggling at some points. Uh, so, yeah, I'd, I'd just love to see a, a settled set of central defenders, whether it's two or three of them, just to really get a run and really get that partnership because it's so important. We saw it in the the championship years with like McKenna and Worrell building up that, that trust with each other, knowing exactly where the other one's going to be. And if the other guy's going to back you up when he's there. Uh, so that's what I want to see. And I mean, if it's Felipe and Murillo, we we'll be in quite a good position, but it's just injuries are key and they're getting the knocks aren't they? So that is always going to be a worry. Yeah. And we'll expand on that tomorrow. I mean, the benefit of doing this full time is we can do you know more shows and we'll be doing that. So we'll have a, a full and preview on Tuesday, Wednesday after the game. Myself and Mark Southerns will um, review the match pretty much straight on the final whistle. So do join us for that. Uh, pretty much covers everything. Any final words before we depart, Lewis? No, no. Well, we've said a lot. We've been going for an hour. There was one other talking point I'll get to another time, which I know Dan, uh, who's a regular viewer, he who created the the vicar moniker which I kind of uh, promoted myself stupidly uh, about if we've got too many players who are on loan out of contract and if we've got some Leicester vibes. So we'll try and get to that tomorrow because it's an interesting point. Uh, Mikey, anything from you before we go? Just a couple of quick things, if you don't mind. Um, Doncaster game on Tuesday for our under-23s, is it? under twenties? So, uh, the EFL Cup, basically, it's a tenner. Um, I've retweeted something from um, a lady called Becky. She's given a load of info about how to get tickets. And they're selling them on the door as well. So um, if you can make that, please go and support the lads. And another thing, well, I think a lot of a lot of concern for it for a guy who um passed out, I think, on Saturday at the game. I think it was in the lower trend, a guy called Anthony. Again, um he's put on Twitter he's okay, and I've retweeted that as well. So anybody that saw that and was concerned, um, don't need to be the guys all right. Other than watching that performance, obviously. But no, thank you for inviting me on that. Enjoyed that. Yeah, if there's a game to miss, the wheel health, and it's that one. Yeah. But glad he's uh, back on track and recovering. Greg, anything from you? Always. I'll take a bit of Lewis's time as well, seeing as he said no. So, <laughs> just quickly, I think Mangala's player of the season so far. We haven't really spoke about him. Um, our glorious banners, Simon Bristow, has been doing a wonderful thing with all his books and how much money he's raising for everyone. Uh, he's now got nine signed copies that he's raffling. Steve Cooper signed copies of his book through Forza Garibaldi's website uh, for Stand Against MND, the charity I'm a trustee for, like a massive friend of mine, Sam Perkins. He's raised 1,400 quid so far, and he wants to try and push it to get to two grand before Friday when the raffle is stopped. So that would be amazing if so. 
And then the one other quick thing is about the young lad, Louis Croft, the singer-songwriter who's been popping up all over Twitter at the minute. Uh, he played a set for us before the game and he was absolutely brilliant, <laughs> like really, really talented. He's not going to be one who's going to be singing the Odd Forest song for long. He's got his own tunes and they're just absolutely brilliant. So it's such a, a great start to the day listening to him and follow him and get him on Spotify and everything. And uh, it was just quite fitting that I started the day with uh, watching him play. It. Oh, God, he must be still in his late teens, maybe. I'm not sure. And then end of the day watching Billy Bragg at Rock City. So <laughs> other than the game, it was quite a good uh, day for me. And if any anyone out there has got some new music or anything, I'm always willing to give it a good shout out if uh, if I enjoy it, obviously. So I'll always do that. So send me your, send me your tunes if you've got them. A football podcast promoting music. We can do that <laughs> as a sideline. Uh, admin, the comments mentioned the FA Cup third round. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll touch on that, but, you know, Blackpool at home, uh, most likely because Forest Green are under investigation for fielding an ineligible player. So they might get booted out, but a revenge chance against Blackpool after a bit of a debacle last season. So uh, we'll discuss that more when we know. Uh, in the meantime, thanks very much to have so many people with us. 300 with us live is great for a first show, considering it's so new. So we really appreciate that. Like I say, like and subscribe. Uh, that will really help us keep this going because it's got to pay my bills now. So it does genuinely help. Give us a good review on iTunes, Spotify. Spread the word, tell your mates. Uh, and great to have so many people in the comments. Mikey, thank you very much. Yeah. <clears throat> Cheers, Matt. Thanks, everybody. Lewis, thank you very much. No, not a problem. Pleasure to be here. And Lewis will be back with us uh, again soon, I'm sure. And we'll expand the rotor a little bit with a few more ex-players if we can and a couple more new faces of fans. But the whole core group is here with the new podcast. So like I say, appreciate the support and having you with us. Finally, Greg, thank you. Uh, cheers, everyone going to the game on Wednesday. Give it a uh, good noise and everyone watching it down to Trent now. Bring a jacket because it might be a bit cold, but at least it's undercover. Curry night at the Trent Nav, our new partners, as I say, £8.50. Very good food, hopefully a good match. Have a good few days, everyone. Thanks very much for your support, and we shall see you soon. <laughs>